Hey everyone, this is Al McKay and welcome to episode 4. This is a interview series part 1, so the subject is mastering your interview and communication skills and getting what you want. Let's dive in, this is part 1. <laughs> Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay and welcome to episode 4. So first of all, the Al McKay podcast has been out for just a little over a week now with over 10,000 downloads. This has been absolutely insane. It's been rated number 5 best podcast on iTunes in the careers category and number 22 best in business. This is out of somewhat 240 million podcasts. So this is absolutely crazy. I really want to thank all of you. It's been a massive amount of hard work. Personal time and my own money has gone into investing into getting this podcast live as well as to keep it going. I'm going to continue to provide you with massive amounts of high quality information to help you improve your career and ultimately your life and finances too. There's been massive amounts of you writing reviews on iTunes, which has been great so far. Now, if you're interested in winning a one month free membership to Digital Tutors, I'm going to give away a couple of these shortly. If you're interested, simply do two things. Like my Facebook page, and then log into iTunes and write a quick review of the podcast. And that's it really, and just click subscribe and give a rating. This shouldn't take more than 60 seconds, And at the end of this month, I'll be randomly choosing a handful of you to receive a free membership to Digital Tutors. So if you're interested, simply pause the podcast now and go subscribe and rate and write a quick review as well as click on like on my Facebook. And at the end of the month, I'll call out a few of your names. All right, guys, so you got to be in it to win it. So get in there and check out the show notes for more information on this. This is going to be exciting. We're going to cover a lot of fun stuff, all to do with job interviews. Some of you are terrified of stepping into the job interview situation. I want to cover how to overcome these fears, as well as how to present yourself better and gain the upper hand in many interview situations, plus negotiate and strengthen your opportunities. There's lots to the subject, and it goes way beyond anxiety. Also, I'm sure some of you might think this mightn't apply to you because your career is going so well and you get jobs consistently and interviewing really isn't a struggle. Well, I have a lot of information specifically for you that will boost your opportunities and help you both with gaining more from negotiations, but also with how people see you. There's never a cap on how you can improve, and I think it's vital to keep improving and raising your game. I will try to keep this talk as mainstream as possible. However, there are still some things that are specifically visual effects related, so I will point those out so that those of you who aren't in visual effects know where each may apply and still take away 90% of this uh, to apply to your own careers as well as to learning and to make a solid first impression or hack your job interview. Uh, All this is very crucial to anyone's success. So I've worked all over the world at many, many small studios, large studios, both freelance and staff, commercials to feature films to video games. I've interviewed well over 200 plus people and I've been uh, interviewed, I'm sure, a uh, pretty damn a lot of times. Um, I've coached many successful artists through the interview process as well as building on their careers as well. And I've been helping um, boost people's careers both one-on-one as well as doing talks to over 20,000 plus people on similar subjects. So this is a subject I know well and there's a lot of core information that goes beyond job interviews and will apply to your day-to-day interactions as well. This is very powerful stuff so there's a lot to gain both long-term as well as bits of information you will be able to apply today, 
to your advantage. One thing that I'm absolutely paranoid about, I'm on vacation this week and I've left sunny California to spend a week with my girlfriend's Canadian family and we're all staying in this big house in South Carolina. I'm actually relaxing in this big house next door to NBA's Xavier McDaniel's house or also known as X-Man. So I've got an interesting view of his big property here which is kind of cool but I'm not sure whether or not I'm going to acquire a bit of a Newfie accent being uh, locked up with six Canadians for the next week or two. So hopefully uh, that doesn't affect me too much, but if you hear any Canadian come out of me, then you know why. Okay, so for the longest time, I've never really had any issues ever with applying for jobs, doing job interviews, that sort of thing, and I didn't think it was really a subject I'd need to cover, but I've seen a lot of other people struggle with this subject, and more specifically to do with the actual, uh, I guess, intensity of going in and having to talk to people and open up and be able to get through the entire interview process just because they're intimidated or they choke or whatever it's going to be. And for me, you know, I've always been pretty social. I've loved to go out to bars and meet strangers and befriend a lot of people. And it's kind of always been who I am. So that aspect of me has never really been something I struggle with. But it's definitely made me kind of begin to look at what I do and where I've had a lot of success because of that, as well as helping other people with a lot that they go through as well. So that being said... There are many of us that are completely petrified of attending job interviews so much that they can't even sleep the night before and when they actually get to the interview, they're a complete mess. Um, one thing that happened last week, I was at a Halloween party in Santa Monica at a bar called Sonoma. Um, I was there with a group of friends and the waiter came out to serve us and he was dressed in a cop's uniform. I was really kind of fascinated by this because even though he was a waiter and he's there typically to kind of accommodate us, I at least personally noticed a bit of tension whenever he came up with his pen and paper out. And I guess it's kind of embedded in us to recognize authority. And the fact that he had a pen and paper out, I didn't think this logically, but I did feel some tension as if like maybe he's there to kind of write us up or do something. Um, but it was one of those things that just for a millisecond, I kind of felt that little bit of angst every single time he came up. And it made me instantly think of this talk that I wanted to do on job interviews because, you know, that was always the struggle I had was like, why do people have this anxiety, this anxiousness when they uh, go to interviews? And this just made it all clear, and that is authority. People typically will go into interviews and they position the interviewer as a th someone of authority. Uh, for a lot of us, the interviewee is the one that's analyzing us and deciding their outcome, whether they get the job or whether they don't get the job. So they're the ones asking the questions and making you, the interviewee, validate every action that you do and that you've done over your career and really kind of sell yourself and your skills as a necessity to their company. And the whole psychological aspect of authority uh, really delves into, you know, you look at TV commercials that they pay an actor to wear like a, a doctor's coat and uh, go out and tell you to buy some medication that they want to sponsor. I mean, you know, the instant recognition and way that we respond to those figures is really powerful. And it's been used a lot for a lot of persuasion uh, in a lot of circles, but it actually is a very powerful one. It, it makes complete sense that when you put someone in that moment of power that they're going to have that effect on you. But you're the one instantly positioning yourself in the position of validation. You need to prove your worth, which means that you're also positioning the interviewer with great value. And it makes absolute sense. And it's really only you that decides whether to uh, give this person this power or not. Now, any experienced and successful interviewer will know that this is very much a two-way conversation. I've had plenty of interviewers where I'm the one diving into the, the conversation and driving um, which way the, the actual interview goes and putting them in a position of validation. It isn't really a power play. It's more that um, just like any relationship, someone needs to have the upper hand. And it's really up to you guys to kind of um, let that unravel because honestly, 
you both go in on equal terms. Just because they're hiring you doesn't mean that you need to be the weaker one or bow down to them. Um, most people find interviews uncomfortable to be in. However, I will give you the most vital and simplified piece of information I can. Only you are responsible for your discomfort. Only you are responsible. You are the cause of your discomfort. What I'm trying to get at is that you're in control. This sounds so simple and obvious, but you need to understand that when you walk into a room and you're intimidated by another person and you feel like he or she is looking down on you and that you need to validate yourself and convince them that you're worthy and, you know, that the whole situation, like, have they ever shown you any indication that you need to feel this way at all? Uh, was it ever stated that you would need to be the subordinate one in this conversation? Um, it's never been that case. It's never been stated that. You and only you can make yourself comfortable or uncomfortable. And it's easier said than done, but at least acknowledging that you're giving away your power is really the first step. I remember going on many dates when I was younger and you would meet like a really attractive girl and whether you're a guy or a girl, you're probably thinking on the date, God, I hope they like me. I better not say anything stupid. I hope I'm really funny and I manage to impress them. What if I don't do well and what if they don't answer my calls after the date? You are instantly putting yourself in a position of validation, whether you're giving them the power, making yourself uncomfortable and nervous. Who decides whether that person is attractive or unattractive? You. Because you're the one making that decision that is affecting you and your actions so much. So what if you take a step back? So what if you take a step back and decide, you know what, I'm going to decide whether I want to see this person again. Maybe they're attractive, but what if they don't make me laugh or this date goes really, really boring? Think about it. This is called reframing. By reframing the situation in your head, you have the power back. You aren't as uncomfortable both with this person and with the outcome. Nothing has changed. They're still the same person, but your self-esteem and your own personal value has. You feel a lot more validated, a lot more in control, and you feel like your personal worth has gone up, which is how it should be. You should try this because the more you do it, the more you realize that you are just as interesting, funny, and great as the other person. And I don't want to make this sound like some kooky foo-foo talk, but this is the issue that you're you're typically dealing with when you go into your interviews and you're giving up all your self-worth and looking to seek validation from the interviewer. What if they don't like me? What if they don't call? Experienced people with years and years of experience get this. They realize job interviews really are just more of a chat. You're merely going there to talk over the logistics of a job and see if you're the right fit for each other. So having that mindset automatically evens out the playing field and you need to do this if you want to succeed. So I said there aren't going to be any uh, foo-foo things going on here, but I do at least for this one subject want to mention a few different mindsets that you can try being in. Uh, find the ones that relate best for you to kind of confidently walk in any job interview or future meeting and not let your heart leap into your throat each time. Um, let me just make something really clear. I've gone through the same things that you've gone through. I've been absolutely petrified of meetings and boardrooms and job interviews earlier in my career, at least at different points of my life as well. Um, this is normal and we've all had it. You're definitely not alone, but I think the successful people are the ones that identify where they need to work on and the things that they need to get better at. So if interviews aren't your strong point, I recommend you get better at them. Before I go any further, I have to mention this because a friend of mine that was a supervisor at Weta in New Zealand worked for uh, a lot of the biggest movies around like back in the day like Titanic, Fifth Element, a lot of other ones at Digital Domain. He's always been someone severely in high demand and he's had every studio after him worldwide but he's also been someone typically that would freeze up during interviews and even though getting the job isn't an issue, for him it's something that he wanted to get better at. So this is something I really admire about him. He would typically go to all the job fairs at Seagraph and all the other big events um, around the world, and he would go in there for interviews just to line them all up, like you know, eight or nine a day, and then just go through and do them. The idea wasn't to get a job, it was just to get the practice. Now, I really admired this because it let him get over his fear of interviews and get more comfortable doing them. 
And there's a lot that you can take from this. Just because you go to a job interview doesn't mean you need to take it. You can just as easily say, you know what, I appreciate your time and I think this is a great fit. I just decided it's not the right time. You've let the door stay open this way and you will be pre-qualified the next time you come back to talk if you want to do that. So the big thing is you get all the practice from doing it. So why not go out there and get comfortable interviewing and you know what, like you get to meet these studios, you get the network. At the end of the day, if you've got a job you like, you can stick with it. No harm, no foul. But putting yourself in these situations is the only way to overcome them and get more comfortable doing it. So the next thing I want you to remember is being socially confident is like a muscle. You need to practice. You need to work it out as often as you can. Most people that know me, I'd say probably describe me as being a pretty confident guy. I have never been shy from working uh, a bar or going out to new cities by myself and typically hanging out with all the bar stuff and having fun just going out and partying. Now this is something I love doing, it's more just my personal traits, I love meeting new people and I love new challenges. I can go to bars and just love to socialize and interact and I love doing that just for the sake of getting to know people. Now one thing I will point out is that I've always been absolutely petrified of going to places by myself when I was younger and by that I mean that if I were to meet someone at a bar and I arrive a little bit early I literally would clumsily not be able to even reach for my phone because I'd just be that uncomfortable and you know you've always got that old guy at the bar who's kind of sitting there laughing at the TV drunk or even just laughing at the wall because he's batshit crazy and He's just having the time of his life. He's happy. He doesn't care what anyone thinks. Everyone thinks he's nuts and is just ignoring him. But he's happy and content in the moment. And I've always looked at those guys and been completely envious of them. Because how do they do it? How do they sit there and they're not worried about everyone around them and what they think of you and all these ridiculous things that aren't really going on and I've always had that and I made a pact with myself when I moved to Vancouver when I was I think 26, 27 that I would overcome this that I would go out to a bar two hours every night seven days a week which is a bit excessive but I would go out at 11 and I would stay out till 1 a.m. And I would just party. I would go and meet people. The whole point is that I would go out by myself and I would get to meet people. I would socialize. I would force myself to stay out. And this is something that was the scariest thing in the world for me to do because what if, you know, what if, what if? Now, for me, uh, it took me probably about 30 days of doing this before I was more comfortable going out by myself than I was going out with friends because for me I would look forward to it I'd look forward to the adventures the craziness that would happen I'd get free drinks everywhere I went I would meet new people I knew every restaurant owner every bar manager everyone at every single place in Vancouver and I loved it everyone was awesome the experience was awesome and I got over this this uh, this phobia or fear or whatever it was that I had that prevented me from being social as well as comfortable in my own skin now I mention this because for me it was such a life-changing experience and it made me realize that you know going from someone who like I literally would be scared shitless being at a bar by myself waiting for a friend to suddenly making wherever I am my home and people around me inviting them into my home uh, it was a complete shift in mindset I remember there'd be times I'd walk into a bar and by that point, I would be able to walk in and I'd see a girl going to sit down at a, at a at her table. I'd run over and sit in her chair before she did. And I'd be like, you snooze, you lose, and have them laugh and then end up sitting in their sister's lap and uncomfortably sit there just because they wanted to enjoy a conversation and chat to me and laugh and have a good time. And we'd get up and then go and meet other people and expand the group. Uh, and this is the kind of stuff that happened all the time. And I use it as an example just because the shift had gone from having this big phobia where I couldn't do anything to literally I walk in five seconds through the door, I'm already looking for something fun 
uh, and kind of silly to do. And I'm not that kind of person these days, but I still like to have fun and be goofy and sometimes uh, shit test people, you know, make them uncomfortable to see how they'll react. But it's all in the humor and fun of doing it. And, you know, the whole point is that you can have these massive shifts. And I, I if I looked at, even heard of that person who was doing the, those kind of things a year before that, I wouldn't believe it was even possible, let alone it being me. And it all comes down to just getting out of your comfort zone and making the commitment to get over these fears that you have. And we all have them. And I've had the same thing with interviews um, where, you know, in meetings where I need to talk to a boss or someone authoritative and I'm completely just locked up and you need to get over that stuff and the more you get used to it the more you get better at it and it's very important very vital that you perfect this so that way you can move forward without having these massive sticking points so it doesn't take long to correct your habits typically 30 days of doing something every day you'll be on the path to bettering yourself but you need to start and I strongly think that if there was one skill to learn it would be to be more confident. The more confident and comfortable you are within yourself, the better that you will be at being around other people and that will translate, your comfort will translate on other people. So if you're comfortable, you will be able to make other people comfortable. And again, that's such a strong mindset, a strong habit, a strong ability to have. So let's just dive on to the subject of mindsets. There are many different mindsets you can have going into an interview. And for the most, we already all do this to some degree, but there are certain types that at least distract you effectively from ever falling into the positioning trap that we've all discussed. But I've seen a lot of you guys run into the issues of freaking out and um, having that kind of paralyzing effect when you do get put in these situations. So one of the most powerful and effective ways to overcome this is through substitution. So in other words, finding what it is that freaks you out and being able to change that around. So your relationship with the person, obviously you see them as an authoritative person, you see them as someone who is going to judge you and is watching every step. You're putting pressure on yourself essentially you need to change this around. And one thing I used to do a lot is I would have Autodesk and other big companies call me up a lot, especially back in Australia, where they didn't have um, many people out there who did that sort of thing. And they'd call me up and ask me to take out clients of theirs that are in town, show them around and spend the night with them and, you know, make sure they have a good time. Now, to me, I was happy to always do that. But at the same time, to go out with someone that you do not know, you do not know anything about them in any kind of context, yet you've got to be their best friend for the next few hours, show them a great time and make sure that they're having the time of their life. This is definitely a challenge. And to kind of switch into that mindset of being able to do that was something that took me some practice and working out how to do it. And this is where it gets weird but this is what I mean by substituting so what I talk about is you need to get up and go meet someone and you gotta play host and if you don't know them it's gonna be very difficult to come up with conversation and do all these things that you want so what I always did when I took clients out male or female would be I treat them like my date and I know that sounds insane and weird Uh, just hear me out I guess now, what I mean by that is that if I need to take someone out on a date, I would, I was pretty good at doing that by being able to play host to them. I would take them out. I would be respectful. I'd be a gentleman. I'd be fun. I'd make sure they have fun. I'd make sure we went to all the great places, had a great time, and had laughs and made sure it's exciting. And it's more about a mode that you switch in that you're able to change that mindset and just become that guy that you've kind of pre-programmed yourself to be so that way you can have a good time and you're not overthinking everything. I mean, I could easily imagine it being a very dull evening where I ask them a hundred work questions like, so what do you do for a living? And oh, so how does this company know you? And what do you think of my city? Screw that shit, okay? So by being able to be fun, charismatic, they're suddenly gonna be like, you know what? 
I had a great time with this guy. I got to look him up next time he's in town. Maybe I can do some business with him. Either way, they're going to have a very memorable night. They're going to speak highly of you to the people that wanted you to go and chaperone them around. There's a lot of benefits just by doing a good job at this. And it does take skill, as in it does take a lot of practice and work to do it. But the whole idea was substituting. One thing that you know I find is more of an automatic mode. You go on a date, you don't need to freak out and do everything. You go out, you play host, and you have a good time. And at the end of the night, they choose whether or not they want to see you again. If you do that, if you apply the same uh, mode that you have of entertaining someone, then you're you know suddenly you're not going to overthink it and that's the overthinking is what causes the problem now to go into dating i wasn't always good at that either but again over time you get confident and better at doing things so for me i would always go on dates and i would freeze up sweat freak out and not know what to say and be the shyest weirdest most uncomfortable person on the planet now that being said Again, and maybe not being as aware of it back then, but I would substitute. So in other words, maybe I treat them like my little sister. And by that, again, sounds very, very weird. But what I mean by that is if you take out all the friction and all the things that you're overthinking and worrying about, what if this happens? What if that happens? And you just treat it like this person, someone goofy that I care about and want to make sure they have a good time, they're laughing. And because they're a little sister or someone smaller, you know, and not as uh, valuable in terms of uh, hierarchy or authority, you're going to just make sure they have a good time. You know, you're not going to overthink things. You're going to take the lead. There's all these things that suddenly drop out when you switch into that mode. So again, it all comes down to just how you want to look at it, how you want to reframe the situation. So I'm not saying to go out on dates and treat them like your little sister, but I am saying that if you start to think of people as this is a buddy of mine, I've known them forever, then you're not going to start to worry about what should I say to them. You know how comfortable you are with your friends where even if you have an uncomfortable silence, you don't overthink it. It's it's fine. And then when you're around people you don't know, suddenly you, you're struggling to think of something because you, you can't dare have a five seconds of uncomfortable silence. And it all comes down to your mind, mindset. So keep that in mind because, again, it applies to when you go for your job interviews as well. Substituting the authoritative figure that you see and freak out about and treat them as an equal. That is what I've always done uh, throughout all of my job interview history pretty much has always been that I will go in and I treat them like an equal. And later on, it became a lot more natural because typically I'd be a client, I wouldn't be an employee. So you are kind of on an even keel. But even in the beginning, I'd always do this. And it wasn't, again, me being goofy or disrespectful or, you know, I'm going to treat them like my buddy and overstep my boundaries. It's more about I'm going to be respectful to them. I'm going to talk to them like I would talk to a friend. And I expect them to talk to me that way. And so I'm always humble. I'm always respectful of who I talk to. But I'm not going to walk in and sit down and wait for them to speak. I'm going to be very open and let the conversation flow. And the cool thing is that maybe they will become your friend just because, you know, maybe they'll call you back um, just because you are putting in the effort to kind of get along with them um, in the future tense, which is they'll get to see you as you and picture you in the company. Now, I'll get into this later on, but typically when you go for a job interview, especially in visual effects, not so much in other fields, but you typically have the job as long as you don't screw it up. They're bringing you in to discuss things in detail as well as to screen you just to make sure that you're not crazy. So again, the more insight into your personality, the better. And it sounds easier said than done, but if you're able to walk in and greet them right away, like, hey, how's it going? Man, you know, traffic was insane, um, you know, but it's so great to finally get here. I've been really big fan of like all the work you guys been doing, and I'm really psyched to actually be in here. Um, again, you know, it's just how you convey yourself, but you're going to do a lot more good than coming in kind of apologetic, putting them in a, in a position where you need to, you know, to talk to them and try and impress them. Um, at the same time, like talk to them about what you've been doing. It's like, yeah, I've been really crazy busy lately, been working on this, this, and this finally finished it all up. I'm getting a bit of a break and this is great timing because I'd love to 
talk to you guys about what you've got going on. Like, how's it all going? You guys have been pretty busy lately. Whatever, you know, it's more about the charisma and the way that you are able to reframe the situation into a fun, normal human environment. And by treating them as your friend, as a buddy that you've known for a long time, you're a lot more comfortable doing that than you would be otherwise going to a cold room. Another mindset which is pretty powerful is just to picture there is a bigger fire you've got to put out today. In other words, if you're stressing out about a specific thing, in other words, you're going for a job interview and you're freaking out about this thing, all you really need to do is convince yourself that you have something 10 times worse that you've got to do later that day. You've got to go and have an operation you know, on your, your brain, your back, whatever. You've got to go and fight aliens in, in Mars later that day and save the planet. Uh, I'm being ridiculous here, but the point is that if you find something to stress you out more and just tell yourself that you've got to do that later that day, anytime that you're thinking about this thing that's stressing you out. If you're like, you know what, I got this other thing to think about and get stressed about that because if you can successfully stress yourself out about the other thing, you won't care as much about the interview. The interview is like, whatever, like I'm going to go in there and do that, get it done, but then I got to do this other thing. That is going to distract you from the pressure that you're putting yourself in. Now, this can be um, pretty effective and I'm trying to think of a great analogy off the top of my head, but I do know the first time I ever came to LA, I did have uh, someone over here kind of scare me a little bit uh, by, I guess, feeding me false information. And I doubt he did it on purpose, but he kind of made it out as if like, you know, because I'd never been through customs before in my life. And he described LAX, which is one of the biggest airports in the world, but he described it as you go through, you're going to go through customs, and then there's another customs, and then you go to baggage claim. Or actually, he said you go through customs and then you get your bags and you go through another customs. So he told me that the final customs is where they're going to ask you a thousand questions and they're really rude to you. They're going to intimidate you and sometimes they'll kick you out of the country. And he had me pretty damn scared, you know, just because I didn't know anything about traveling or understand this at all. So because of that, it meant that I went through customs and they were actually pretty intimidating because I actually was staying exactly three months to the day and I had a set amount of money. I was only 21 years old and they, you know, they were just kind of like, you know, make sure that you leave on this date and we're not, you know, we're thinking about not letting you in just because of this and, and whatever. So because of that, I wasn't worried about it. I was, I was like, okay, who cares what these guys say? Because um, I know the big one I've got to worry about is actually after I get my bags, I've got to go through that other thing and that's going to be hell. So I was freaked out about that and the customs I was going through, I wasn't worried about at all. Um, my friend had it all wrong and they, that was the customs and that was the bit that I think I would have been more uh, stumbling on my words and tripping on everything I say and being really intimidated if I wasn't worried about this bigger thing, like, wow, if this is bad, this other thing must be 10 times worse. So I wasn't worried at all. I'm just like, yep, yep, I understand. I get that. You know, talk, talk, talk. Not a big deal. And this isn't the best analogy, but the whole point that it, I believe it does successfully make is that if there is a bigger fire to put out, then you're not going to worry so much about um, the one that's right in front of you. And so just convince yourself that you have bigger fish to fry that day. Uh, you know, you've got to go and fly into Mars, whatever it's going to be. But if you do that successfully, then this is going to be a walk in the park. It's like, okay, I got to go talk to this dude and leave a good impression. And then I got to go do this other thing. Okay. So sounds a bit silly, but again, it's a very, very powerful. So keep that in mind. Now, that being said, there are plenty of tricks to calm your nerves. Typically people who are most uncomfortable when they walk into a room, the first time they go in that room, famili familiarity, <laughs> I knew I'd have trouble saying that word, but familiarity is definitely very important. And a friend of mine who writes for Rolling Stone magazine, who, who quite often has to interview a lot of big celebrities from Marilyn Manson through to, you know, Lady Gaga, Madonna, you name it. Um, he has a bit of a routine that he does because typically you meet someone for an interview, you go in, you do the 15 minute interview, and for him, he would then get up and say, let's go get a quick bite to eat, come back and then do the interview. And for him, the first 15 minutes is a throwaway. It's an icebreaker because 
for him, you know, when you're going to sit down, you're going to have your guard up, you're also in a new environment, um, you're typically going to be kind of un uh, uncomfortable. So by going in there, kind of sniffing out the room, sitting down, going through the motions, then getting up and going to, uh, to get a, a bite, letting your defenses down, coming back, the second time coming back in that place, you you know what to expect. You've already kind of mentally prepared yourself. You're a lot more comfortable. All the the tense things that pop up, and it's not about like worrying about it. It's just more being in a new environment. Those things typically go away. So when I say this, it means that if you go uh, for a job interview, you go into a tiny little room with one, two, three people sit down and chat for a moment and say, you know what, um, I have to apologize, but do you mind if I go to the bathroom? I'll be very brief and I'll be right back. Thanks again, I apologize and I'll be back in a second. Maybe not so apologetic, but the whole point is that by going out of that room and coming back in, you've already made that disconnect. And again, these are all mental things, but I want you guys to be aware of this so you can find the ones that do fit your personality type better. So, simply going out and going to the restroom gives you a chance to kind of reset. And if you want, you can comb your hair, rap to your favorite Jay-Z song in the mirror, and uh, loosen up a little bit, whatever you want to do. But, you know, the whole point is when you come back in, you want to be loosened up and got an, you know, switch out of that mode of being so tense. So when you sit back down, you've mentally prepared, you're coming back into a room that you're familiar with. Uh, a lot of those things that you were tight about earlier, uh, by that point should have gone. So it's just a, a chance to give your brain a bit of a disconnect, to reset your brain and gain some comfort level back. So whatever it is, there are dozens of effective ways to trick yourself into not stressing out during interviews. For trying to remember what to say, you can simply write up all your key things you need to remember on a little palm card and read it to yourself in the lobby while you're waiting to get called in. So all the things that you know that you need to say, your little pitches or you know what people uh, want to ask you about movies you've worked on or really strong character traits you have, uh, just give yourself a little bit of a refresher. You could look at this on the train ride in. You don't even need to have it on palm cards. You could have it on your phone if you want to. Uh, the important thing is practicing all this will help you when you're put on the spot and you need to sell your skills and experience. Putting these on your phone or whatever else, just somewhere accessible so that way you can kind of recap on this beforehand just so that way you know you can keep practicing and make it kind of second nature all these big elevator pitches that you need to have. Um, if you read all the books uh, exercise and hydration and sleep the night before are all key. Uh, I like to listen to confident speakers sometimes just before I go in just to kind of adopt their mindset a little bit. And I just mean that if you're on a podcast listening to Tony Robbins or someone, I'm just saying whoever, but someone um, you know who's confident in speaking, you tend to kind of pick up their mannerisms and their, adopt their charisma a little bit. So I sometimes do that just because um, I tend to work and I've got like obviously I work, I tend to work uh, crazy schedules and sometimes I'll need to stop one thing and then run uh, across the street or you know a few blocks away to have a meeting with like for instance I had a meeting with Activision last week and I literally had to go from intensely trying to finish everything up before I went to South Carolina launching um, Houdini and Maya courses and about to announce another course uh, on effects and scripting and uh, so trying to get all of that done in one day before I went out that night and having a meeting with Activision for an hour and a half um, I know my brain is still going to be in my work so even in that five minutes because they're across the street from where I live uh, just running across the street to go to their office and have a quick chat just listening on my, on my iPod uh, to someone else speak who's confident and just going to switching into how they speak um, it sounds silly but again those are the things that are little hacks that you know as as stupid as they sound are the most effective and so adopting those things definitely can help so at the end of the day what's the worst that could happen you could tell yourself that you know you're still going to be alive you're nothing physically bad is going to happen to you there you know, they may say no is the worst thing that they could really say. So 
as long as you know that and you gave it the best you had, um, it's not the end of the world, okay? So it doesn't mean you go in with a defeated attitude, but just realize you're going to be talking to a single person and that person is probably just as uncomfortable or afraid as you are. I mean, you know, not everyone comes in born to, to do this stuff. So, I mean, if you just look at them as an, as an equal person and that they probably don't want to be there um, either, you know, there's definitely just things that you can help comfort you into uh, doing better at what you do. Here's the last thing, and this applies more to visual effects than other jobs, but most of the time when they're bringing you in for an interview, you really already have the job. As uh, the guys at Riot who developed League of Legends said to me on the phone not too long ago, um, I was just chatting to them about a project that I was considering, and, you know, they called up, we, you know, talked a little bit, and they just said, this isn't really an interview, you're pretty much, you pretty much already have the job, we just want you to come in as a formality, just to make sure you're not batshit crazy. And, you know, of course, a lot of laughter after that, and, like, we got along really great, um, and, you know, I remember them saying that just because I already knew that, and I've, I've known that for a long time, that, you know, you go in, it's more to screen, and I've done that a hundred times, we've brought people in, just to make sure that they're not going to cause friction, um, you know, with the rest of the studio, and you're typically brought in just to chat, and go over the project specifics, the start date, answer any questions you might have, and more if anything, put a face to the name, and yes, if any alarm bells go off, and I have seen this happen too, but then they might renege on the offer, but you are practically going to just stroll in, and as long as you're not wearing a, a straight jacket or something, then um, you know you've 99% of the time you've got the job, and all you're doing is just coming in for a quick chat, and that's it. So act as if you have the job, and just come in to shoot the shit and talk things over and be excited. I mean, those are the key things to kind of take away from this. So. This is definitely a, a bit of a different episode, but it's definitely one of the more core parts of job interviews people have a major sticking points with, so it's worth tackling these now before we move forward because none of the other information will really apply if you can't get a word out because you're so frightened in the interview. So guys, work on this. Like me and the infinite bars I'd visit, your social abilities are like a muscle and you need to work on them and work them hard to build comfort. And if you're uncomfortable, you're going to make everyone else uncomfortable. So shake it off and have fun. So that's it for this episode. Next episode, I will continue with this and dive further into negotiations, preparing for job interviews, what to do after an interview or how to get the upper hand during our discussions as well as money and everything else in between so thanks for listening and don't forget to enter the contest to win a membership to digital tutors um, all you need to do is simply uh, like my facebook page as well as subscribe and write a review on itunes and at the end of the month i will pick a couple of you guys to give you memberships for one year uh, for all of Digital Tutors, which is, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of uh, good things out there. So check it out. And remember, guys, you got to be in it to win it. So check the course notes and get in there. Lastly, I'll see you guys in a couple of days with another episode. Thanks again, and I'd love your input, uh, as I'll be doing a lot more of these career episodes.